oligohydramnios versus polyhydramnios. Now, before we talk about these different conditions, we really need to touch on the pathophysiology in terms of how amniotic fluid functions in utero. So movements of amniotic fluid are done in one of two ways or both. The first is that you can swallow. So we see a baby here. Um, th if the baby swallows fluid, that is to say that the baby swallows amniotic fluid, amniotic fluid will move from the amniotic sac into the baby's body, okay? So the first way that we move amniotic fluid is via swallowing. Now, if I ask you, What's going to happen to amniotic fluid if baby swallows it? Well, the fluid that's actually in the amniotic space will decrease because it's no longer in the amniotic space. and Now it's in the baby's body. So swallowing decreases amniotic fluid. Now, what's the way of getting fluid out from the baby back into the amniotic space? Well, that would be the baby urinating. So that is how uh, amniotic fluid can move. This is number two. So baby can swallow and decrease the fluid, or baby can urinate, and if the baby urinates, then the fluid moves from the baby into the amniotic space, therefore increasing fluid. So in review so far, pathophysiologically speaking, and this really isn't too complex, amniotic fluid can move from the amniotic space into the baby or vice versa. It can move into the baby if baby swallows, thereby decreasing amniotic fluid, or the fluid in the amniotic space can increase if baby urinates, and pisses out amniotic fluid back into that space. So that's how fluid shifts. Now with that in mind and an understanding of what's really not complex pathophysiology, let's talk about the difference between oligo and polyhydramnio. So here you see our same drawing side by side and we're gonna touch on exactly what makes these things different. So imagine if you will, that there's fluid in the space marked there by the red X's. If there's too much fluid in that space, that is to say there's too much amniotic fluid, that is called polyhydramnios, okay? Now, by contrast, imagine on the right that there's too little fluid in the space marked by the blue X's. If there's too little amniotic fluid in that space, that's oligohydramnios. So just from the perspective of what we're talking about here, polyhydramnios means too much amniotic fluid in the amniotic space. Oligohydramnios means too little amniotic fluid in the amniotic space. And if we break these words down and really simplify what it means, Polyhydra amnios. Poly means too much. Hydra means water. Amnios means amnio. So too much water of amnio or too much amniotic fluid. Oligo hydra amnios. Oligo means few or little. Hydra means water and amnios is amnios. It's describing the type of liquid. So oligo few or little. Hydra means water. Amnios means amnios, so too little water of amnios, which is the same thing in English as too little amniotic fluid. So this is what we're talking about, guys. Big step backwards here. Let's keep the, let's simplify this. I don't want you to see the words and get confused. With that in mind, let's go back to the pathophys. So we said that there are two different ways that amniotic fluid shifts can occur at number one and number two, right? So number one is swallowing, and number two is urination. So with that in mind, if you know that the condition is polyhydramnios, which means that there's too much amniotic fluid in the amniotic space, at number one, how does that occur? So if swallowing decreases the fluid or shifts it from the amniotic space into the baby, if we're talking about polyhydramnios, or lots of amniotic fluid, that must be at number one due to decreased swallowing. So with that in mind, let's think, what causes decreased swallowing in utero? Well, that could be things like developmental delays in the GI system, such as a, a tracheoesophageal fistula, duodenal atresia, esophageal fistula, it doesn't matter. What Basically, anything that decreases swallowing, anything that prevents the baby from adequately swallowing liquid, will cause the swallowing to not occur, and therefore more fluid will build up in the amniotic space, causing polyhydramnios. So at number one, decreased swallowing causes polyhydramnios. Let's try number two. If you know that we're talking about polyhydramnios, how can we make changes in urination to cause too much amniotic fluid? Well, we're talking about urination, so of course that's gonna be increasing urination, okay? Makes sense. Now the question becomes, what causes increased urination in utero? Well, the major cause of this is going to be maternal diabetes, which is the same thing as saying that you have a hyperglycemic baby, okay? So when mom is diabetic, baby will be big, baby will have high blood sugar itself and over-secrete insulin, and when it does this, 
when baby's blood sugar is elevated above what it should be, it's going to lead to polyuria. So it's going to urinate a lot. And if baby urinates a lot, it's literally peeing out more amniotic fluid into the amniotic space. So at number two, increased urination causes polyhydramnios, which is to say that maternal diabetes or a hyperglycemic baby or a baby that pisses nonstop will cause polyhydramnios. So as you can see, I'm attacking this at two different points in the pathophysiology. One is what's happening with swallowing, and two is what's happening with the urinary system. Those are the causes of polyhydramnios. If you understand the pathophysiology, understanding causes of it, and understanding what the word means is really, really simple. So let's switch gears and talk about oligohydramnios. So just like with too much amniotic fluid, with too little amniotic fluid, it can occur at either number one with swallowing or number two with the urinary system. So let's start with number one. This one's easy. There's really nothing that you need to know because if there's too little amniotic fluid, it's not like babies just drinking, 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 drinking because it likes the taste of amniotic fluid. So normally you don't have to know anything with number one. What's really high yield with oligohydramnios is number two, and that's the urinary system. So if someone has, if a baby is experiencing oligohydramnios, what's going on at number two? Well, there's too little amniotic fluid, which means baby is not urinating. And this is really, really high yield because developmental abnormalities that cause decreased urination include any type of bladder outlet obstruction or polycystic kidney disease. So that's really where you're going to see decreased urination. But again, it could be anything that causes the baby not to urinate. So they might throw other distractors at you. They could test your knowledge with other things. But basically, if you step back and keep the general picture in mind, decreased urination means baby's not urinating, which means less amniotic fluid is being urinated out into the amniotic space. Okay, so those are the big differences. Now, I want to touch on something that's very, very high yield. In oligohydramnios, you get something called pulmonary hypoplasia. And I want to talk exactly about why that is and walk you through the pathophysiology. So here are the developing lungs, okay? And the baby's sitting in the sac, in the womb, and outside of it, it should have this beautiful amniotic fluid depicted there by our blue water drop. So normally, at normal, normal physiology, baby is going to be swallowing an adequate amount of that amniotic fluid, and that amniotic fluid is going to go down into the baby's lungs and kind of expand the baby's lungs and put a little internal stress on the lungs. And that's part of normal pulmonary development. Without that internal stress sort of inflating the lung, if you will, and it's not actually like that, but I'm really just boiling it down to make you understand it. Without amniotic fluid being swallowed by the baby, going into the lungs and expanding the lung space, causing a little bit of internal stress, there's, there's an abnormal pulmonary development. And that leads to pulmonary hypoplasia. So if we knock out that amniotic fluid, that is to say we have oligohydramnios, too little amniotic fluid, you get none of this physiology. And in turn, lungs are small and you have pulmonary hypoplasia. Okay, so that is very, very, very high yield. It's a high yield association with oligohydramnios, pulmonary hypoplasia, because you don't get the amniotic fluid down into the lungs to help the lungs develop normally. Now, pulmonary hypoplasia is part of a larger sequence or syndrome, if you will, known as the Potter sequence. So the Potter sequence is a very, very high yield association with oligohydramnios. So just like what we just touched on with the pulmonary hypoplasia, I want to take it one step further and walk you through the Potter sequence. So the way that I remember Potter sequence is with my mnemonic Potter. Okay, so the way that the Potter sequence normally begins is that the baby has renal agenesis. Of course, I spelled agenesis wrong because I can't type for anything, but renal agenesis or agensis, if you're reading my slide. So if baby's gonna get renal agenesis, which means baby cannot urinate. So decrease urination, which corresponded to number two on my pathophysiology depiction, decrease urination means less amniotic fluid goes out into the amniotic space. Now, when that happens, you have oligohydramnios. And if you have oligohydramnios, you have pulmonary hypoplasia. So we just talked about those two things in the previous discussion about pulmonary hypoplasia. But so far in the Potter sequence, it starts with renal agenesis. So there's something wrong with the kidneys. Baby can't urinate. If baby can't urinate, there's less amniotic fluid in the amniotic space. That is by definition oligohydramnios. If you have oligohydramnios, you can't swallow the fluid and cause normal lung development. So you get pulmonary hypoplasia. So three out of the six symptoms of the Potter sequence or Potter syndrome we've already accounted for. Let's talk about T, T, and E in my Potter mnemonic. So here's baby and baby's normally chilling 
in the womb, protected by the amniotic fluid. In oligohydramnios, there's decreased amniotic fluid. So the baby no longer is cushioned by the amniotic fluid, and baby is going to be banging all over the uterus, getting smashed into the uterine walls, and there's going to be a lot of pressure and a lot of tension put on the baby from the uterus because there's decreased amniotic fluid to cushion the baby. It's like, imagine jumping into a waterbed. Well, if you drained all the water out of your waterbed and jumped onto the rough box spring or rough mattress without the water, it's going to hurt. You're going to feel a lot of tension. When baby is smashing into the uterine walls and experiencing all of that uterine tension due to decreased amniotic fluid, aka due to oligohydramnios, a couple things are going to happen. One is that you're going to see extremity deformities, that's our E, and the two T's are twisted facies, and twisted skin. So baby's gonna have like really wrinkled skin, it's gonna have a deformed face, and you're gonna get extremity deformities with strange contractures in the limbs because the baby developed not in fluid because there was too little, it was oligohydramnios, and instead it was getting pushed up against the uterine without all of that protection. So that guys is the Potter sequence. It's a very, very high yield association. If you can understand how we walked through that, you'll know absolutely everything that you need to know about oligohydramnios and by contrast, polyhydramnios. So guys, that's it. You're now masters of the amniotic fluid system in utero. This has been oligohydramnios versus polyhydramnios brought to you by Dirty USMLE.